Hello, and thank you for joining me. Today, I want to talk about Mercury's movement through the lunar sign of Punarvasu. Hi, I'm Ram Das Bill Sinclair. I hope you'll like and subscribe to this site. Today, we're going to be talking about Mercury's movement through this lunar sign of Punarvasu. As you may know, in the Vedic system, we have a solar zodiac, which is Aries, Taurus, Gemini, those signs people are familiar with. We also have a lunar zodiac. And what the lunar zodiac tells us is how the planet is feeling, what's going on on the kind of emotional, intellectual level of the planet. There's 27 lunar signs. Uh, divided among the 12 houses. So we're coming into the last section of Gemini, which is ruled by uh, this sign called Punarvasu. Now, Mercury is gonna be in Punarvasu from July 26th until August 3rd. On, and he'll be all, he'll be stay in the sign of Gemini up until the very last day. The first three degrees, 20 minutes of Cancer are also included in this lunar sign. So we're gonna concentrate mainly on um, how he's gonna be doing in Gemini and how this will impact our thoughts, ideas, creative abilities, things like that. Mercury in Punarvasu is in a neutral sign because it's ruled by Jupiter. So they're pretty neutral to each other, which means Mercury has the ability to fully express all of his various you know, thoughts, ideas, tendencies. So it can be considered um, a good place for Mercury to be. Now, Gemini itself is a restless sign, and this is where our wants and desires, needs, all this stuff starts to emerge is in the sign of Gemini. So Mercury is going to be um, reacting to some of those ideas. Gemini is ruled by Mercury um, itself, so that makes him even stronger in this sign. Mercury's behavior in the chart is largely influenced by the other planets that are in the sign with him. So when he's in there for this transit, we have to remember that Rahu is also in the sign of Gemini. And Rahu kind of acts like a plow cutting through the dirt, let's say, of our subconscious, and he churns things up and churns things up. So it's likely that, you know, during this whole time which um, Mercury has been in Gemini, that your anxiety level has been increased. And that is going to change um, on August 2nd when he moves out of that area. But in this last section, there's some important things that we can kind of uh, gather from this whole process. And we're gonna be talking about that today. So um, the one thing I said is like, you know, Rahu goes through and turns things up, but sometimes that uncovers gems and diamonds. I mean, really um, good things can be surfaced along with also the feeling of disruption. So let's talk about the, the narrative that's associated with the sign of Punarvasu. So the symbol they use for Punarvasu is a bow, like a bow and arrow. And specifically, this is the bow that was used when Sita, the wife of Rama, was um, engaged. So I wanna tell you that story because I think by knowing the story, you'll be able to think about this, work with it yourself, and get even more information. So it's important when you study the narratives of uh, Vedic astrology that you just, you know, start to get the ideas in your head, get the timeline of the story down, and then you'll think, as you think about it, different parts will resonate, and they'll actually open up and give you a sense of what the energy in that area of the zodiac means. So, the story is that Sita was a princess and she lived um, in this kingdom in ancient India. And one day she, when she was a young, a young girl, um, probably early adolescent, you know, she was out in the garden, they had these beautiful big gardens, and she was with her three cousins. So all four of them were princesses and they're in this beautiful garden filled with mango trees and all the lush flowers and everything. And what they were doing is they were braiding garlands of flowers. So if you've been to India, or if you've seen pictures of India, people wear these gorgeous garlands of flowers. 
So the young girls were braiding jasmine flowers. And usually what they do, it's a thin white kind of braid and they wear that in their hair for an ornament. It smells really beautiful. So this is what they were busy doing. And they realized that they couldn't reach the jasmine flowers because they were too high up in the tree. And so Sita, kind of without thinking, went into the weapons house and she grabbed a bow, an arrow, and came out. And with one shot, she shot through the mango tree and it loosened all the flowers and they fell to the ground in this beautiful cascade. And they were, none of the flowers were damaged in the fall, so they could all be used. So the princesses were very happy and they went about braiding, you know, the garlands together. What they didn't know was um, Sita's father, King Janaka, was watching. And he was amazed by this because the bow that Sita grabbed was a bow that had been used by Shiva. Um, and it was very powerful. And most people couldn't even lift the bow, much less string it and shoot it. And Sita had effortlessly gone in there and got the bow and with one shot done all of this. So he recognized this as a sign of the very special um, person that Sita was. And so he then decided, because she was coming into the age of um, you know, being engaged, that uh, he would make a competition so that only a very noble prince could win her hand. And so the competition was a uh, uh, prince had to come, he had to be able to lift the bow, string it with a string, you know, and then be able to shoot the arrow. So it was customary in those days that the woman got to choose her husband. So many, many men came and applied, of course, to be Sita's husband because her father was a powerful king and she was um, a really, you know, re revered through many kingdoms for her character and her abilities. And so none of them could do it. No one could lift the bow. So at that same time, Rama was in the forest and he heard of this competition. So he went over there with his brother and stepped up and effortlessly picked up the bow and was able to string it. And in fact, he was so strong, not only could he bend the bow to string it, but he actually ended up breaking the bow. And so this is the story. Everyone was very excited. Sita leapt to her feet. She was so happy to meet him. And Rama Sita, who are, you know, one of the divine couples in, you know, the Vedic um, understanding of the world, were united. Now, what comes to be known is that actually Rama is the incarnation of Vishnu, who is Mahavishnu, who is the Lord of all creation. All that was, all that is, and all that will be is Lord Vishnu. And Sita is Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. And she's the one who, that's the eternal partner of Vishnu. So we have in this section of the sky the meeting of um, uh, Vishnu and uh, Lakshmi. So that makes it a very special and powerful place. So I've been thinking a lot about what does that mean to us? We know the story tells us it's very powerful and that we can do all this. And I think the first thing that comes to mind is that this is the place where we can discover our hidden talents. Because Sita had no idea that this is a special bow. She was just acting on her instinct. And so what seemed very natural to her, of course, because, you know, Sita did not know she was Lakshmi. She was a manifested on earth at that time. And so she was in the Maya. So she thought she was just Sita. And so this is a place where we can discover this. Our um, hidden talents and abilities, things that we may have earned in past life can all be coming up. Now, Mercury is going to be moving very quickly through these signs. It's just from July 26th through August the 3rd. So it's a little over a week. So I was looking at how we could use this energy for um, ourselves. And what does this mean to us? And I thought, you know, it's very interesting. Rahu the plow just went through this sign in 2019. So he was in Punarvasu from January 2nd, 2019, up until September 11th. 2019. So I, if you think back to those nine months, January through the beginning of September of last year, this is where the, uh, the things got churned up, the, the hidden talents got revealed. 
And now Mercury is coming along, which gives us the ability to understand them, to recognize them, and to begin to work with them. This is a really good way to use this energy in this, this you know, week that he's active and see what comes to mind and also see what has changed since um, you know, the last year. Because once it, it may be that the change has already taken place, but we haven't really stopped to recognize it as a change. I'd like to go through little, each sign and just share a few ideas with you about where you may be seeing that change in your life. And this is based on which house um, Gemini is placed in in your chart, because that tells us what area of life this is likely to manifest in. And this may help clarify the areas of life you could talk about for that January to September time frame. So for Aries rising, you're going to have found new ways to connect and communicate with siblings and colleagues. For Taurus, you have new understandings of talents and abilities from your family of origin that um, what used to be seen as weakness may be seen differently now. Geminis will be, have a new understanding of your personal brand, how you interact with others, what you truly value, how you see in the world, how you want to present yourself in the world, and really what matters to you and what you want in your life. Because Gemini is in the first house, it's really going to, it could be a major shift in your chart. And it may just be a deeper understanding of things you had already known all along, or maybe you finally will begin to take action on those things that have been kind of floating in the back of your mind. Cancers gain deeper insights into your intu intuitive abilities, and you can rebalance that uh, concept of connection and isolation in your life. Leos gain a deeper understanding of what you really want to control and how you want to connect with people. This is always an issue with Leo, is that you're a being a natural leader, you have to balance that. When are you controlling a situation? When are you just stepping back and just connecting with people and letting it roll out by itself? Virgos have, will gain clarification of what you really want to do with your life how you, what's your career, your daily task, how you want your name and fame to be seen in the world. Libras connect with good luck and fortune due to you from past positive actions. So think about the blessings that may have emerged in your life since last um, January, since January 2019. Um, you may be surprised at what you find. Scorpios have, will be finding new ways to cope with old patterns and to release past emotional bonds. That can be very interesting. Think back, something that used to plague you may have just started to disappear, and you can actively work to continue to move that out of your life. Sagittarius have new dimensions around relationship and communicating, with, communicating what you need. So Sagittarius, in a positive and gentle manner, will have a different understanding of what really fulfills you, especially in your relationships, both personal and, and in business. Uh, Capricorns have the ability to access forgiveness towards those who have caused you pain in the past. This is again, this kind of thing of the plow going through and releasing old things and realize that maybe those links that were in the ground have been cut and you can free yourself to move on. Aquarius, satisfaction will arise out of helping others. And for Pisces, establish your home as your sanctuary. Great insights and abilities can be awakened. I hope you've enjoyed this story kind of approach to understanding um, the parts of the zodiac. If you like this, I'm actually going to be teaching a course on all 27 nakshatras, which will start um, on August 18th of 2020, this year, and we'll go for 12 weeks and really spend time digging into each of these signs. Thank you very much for watching. Namaste.